Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Time Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the rights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones you can't solve right now, and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go, and drifting into sleep. Just a quick note for new listeners, if this is your first time joining us. Part of the plan with the show is this long intro, which goes on for roughly 15 minutes. If you want to skip the intro and go straight to the story, there is a timestamp in the show notes that will get you straight there. But aside from a little bit of promotion I'm about to go into, the intro does have a purpose which I will get into in a few minutes. So I do recommend you stick around for at least a little while, especially if this is your first time. Tonight I want to reiterate again and repeat from last week. I'm doing a, I have a short survey up at the moment, asking listeners what sort of story formats they prefer. It has literally three questions and the average time that I'm getting to, for people to finish the survey is 33 seconds. So if you have 33 seconds or a minute to spare, please go to survey.sleepytimetales.net and fill in the very quick short survey, which has literally two content related questions. How long have you been listening to the show and what sort of story format you prefer, original or reading or no preference. And uh, it also asks you for your email if you want to send me to sign you up to the newsletter. So when you're up tomorrow, if you've got 30 seconds to spare, please take a look at the survey and um, have your input to talk about what sort of stuff you want to listen to. Now, obviously, I ask if you prefer the original stories. I haven't done an original story since getting my new equipment. So that if you're a new listener and you've heard some of the old ones, the sound quality is not great. But the new one, any new originals I do will be um, more like what you're hearing now. I do have an original story planned for episode 50, uh, something that I think will be a pleasant surprise to long-time listeners and will also resonate, I think, with new listeners. So once again, in the morning, once you're awake, please take a minute to go to the survey.sleepytimetales.net to give your feedback. The link to the survey will also be in the show notes. Now, most podcasts you may listen to will put their promotion and their cup rattling and asking for support either halfway through the show or towards the end. But because by design you're going to be asleep before you get to the end of the show, I need to put the unpleasant business stuff up front. So if you don't want to listen to me rattling a tin cup, there is a timestamp in the show notes to get to the main story, and I absolutely do not take it personally if you skip to that. Having said that, I'd like to thank the listeners that have supported the show so far and are currently supporting the show on Patreon. You have all been instrumental in helping me to keep the show running. Whether you back the show for a few months or even one month at any level, I'm very grateful for your support. So if you're finding that the show helps you to get a good night's sleep, whether it's weekly, nightly, or however often you need to listen to it, and you would like to do your part to help me keep the show running and available for free, I'd like you to ask you to take a look at patreon.com slash sleepytimetales, also linked in the show notes, to take a look at the support levels and bonuses that are available to patrons. And um, if you're inclined, if you're finding the show beneficial, if you have the means and you want to, To help me keep the show going and available for hundreds if not thousands of people, please consider signing up at whatever level is comfortable to you to continue supporting my work. There are bonuses available from even as little as a dollar a month, very useful ones, bonus mini-sodes every week, and uh, $5 you get uh, special edits of the shows. But if you don't have the means or inclination to support financially, Another huge way you can help the show is to simply spread the word. If there is someone else in your life you think will benefit from listening to Sleepy Time Tales, 
just let them know. If you recommend the show on social media, make sure to tag me in so that I know and I can thank you. I'm at Sleepy Time Tales on Instagram or Twitter. Another huge way to help a lot of people ask for ratings and reviews and stuff, and this is not something I generally do. Ratings and reviews are nice, but what really actually helps is if you're listening to the show on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, hit this, hit the subscribe link. You'll get new episodes as soon as they come out. And that actually, new subscribers is one of the better metrics for um, new podcasts out there. So if you're, if you're liking the show, hit subscribe and get your fresh dose of me droning in your ears every week. Finally, I'd like to shout out the music, which uh, you've used in the show since day one. And I think it's a very important part of the identity of the show. I've had one listener tell me that they start dozing off the second they start hearing that guitar music in the beginning. The music is Undeser by Kumiku. Their music, or their, move, their music is available on the Free Music Archive. I've linked their website and their Patreon in the show notes as they've got some very cool stuff, which they release under different names, actually. So if it looks like I've linked to something else, I haven't made a mistake. They release different styles under different names, and I recommend checking it all out. There's some extremely cool stuff there. Uh, thank you for taking the time, and let's get back to the show. So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales? What is it for? It's a bit of a strange idea, isn't it? A podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to? But lack of sleep is a chronic problem in the 21st century. It's a health crisis for modern life. And this is a podcast that is intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night with your mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3 a.m.? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. I'm someone who has struggled to sleep ever since I was a baby. My parents had sleepless nights with me for many years, and even once I got old enough not to bother them anymore, sleep was always a struggle for me. I discovered later in life that uh, droning male voices have a tendency to put me to sleep almost like I've been tranquilized. Uh, I was listening to podcasts and falling asleep in the middle of them, and then I discovered one day that there are podcasts and uh, storytelling shows out there specifically for the purpose of helping people to sleep. And I realized, hey, I've got a dr droning, boring male voice. Let me give it a try and see if I can help some others out myself. So now, as I said up front, there's the, this long intro, which usually goes on for roughly 15 minutes. It is there for a reason. Oh, there's, it's there for two reasons, actually. The primary purpose, or the first purpose, is to explain the structure and the point of the show to new listeners. And for people who've been with me for a while, the, this whole intro with me droning on and saying more or less the same thing every now and then, it's part of this sort of almost like a ritual or the habit we're creating of creating a sleep, uh, creating the ability to sleep. Because insomnia is a habit that we develop over our lives and uh, the best way to lose habits is to replace them with other ones. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a space together, a nest or a cave or a cozy little cabin in the woods, whatever it is that helps you to create that mindset, uh, desire and impulse to sleep. Now, as far as I know, there's a couple of different ways to engage with the show. While I'm going to read you a story tonight, it's not, the story itself isn't all that important. What um, some people do is, what I, need, what I need to do is, when I'm struggling to sleep, I listen to a sleep podcast or something like that. And basically, I need a story with something happening in it that I can focus on and then um, drift off when sleep comes for me. I'm not inclined to resist it or be stressed. I need something to distract that stress and anxiety. Some people, it's a little bit more primal. Some people just need a noise in the background. Can be white noise, can be the sound of waves, can be the sound of rain, or maybe it's just some boring guy with a droning 
baritone voice. Now, I'm doing another reading tonight. I've decided I'm going to stick with the readings for a little while while I do some writing for some of my original stories. I've done a... I may have referred elsewhere to the survey that I'm running to get um, impressions from listeners. And basically, most people don't have a preference exactly whether the story is original or a classic reading. Uh, Some people do prefer the classic readings, actually, and it's actually made me realize that I do like the original stories and I want to carry on doing them, but I need to spend a little bit more time on them. So every week there will be something out and while I'm, there'll be readings while I'm building up to a new storyline. And we're now on episode 48. I've got a fun surprise for long-time listeners coming up for episode 50, something that uh, occurred to me recently. Uh, Yeah, so something long-time listeners, I think, will love and new listeners may appreciate. And it will stand on its own, whatever happens. But whatever the story is I tell, whether it's original or a serial story or just something that I'm reading out to you, the most important thing is that whatever you do, you don't force the sleep. You just need to keep a light mental grip on the story and allow the need for sleep to come for you when it's ready. Now, obviously, I'm hoping that you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but it's very important that you don't feel pressurized. I'm here with you right till the end, and maybe, especially if this is your first night here, maybe this one episode isn't going to be enough. It may take you a few nights to get used to the strange idea of listening to a podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to, or my accent, or my voice. Things may, you may just need to adjust and... uh, Take some time, so you need to be patient. But whatever you do, it's important that you try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, as I say, this may take a while to work for you. I recommend you give it at least two or three days, two or three nights, just to see if it works for you. Don't give up quite yet, even if it doesn't work for you on your first night. So queue up a few episodes or just run through the backlog. What I do with my sleep podcasts is I just let them stream all night. I lie in the dark with my earbuds in and let them run. Sometimes when I wake up at 3am, the stream is still running and I let the voices waft me back to sleep. Sometimes I wake up 30 minutes before my alarm goes. Usually I carry on listening and that knocks me right back out. And I've got to tell you, that 30 minutes that I have before the alarm is sometimes the best part of my night. There's something about allowing yourself to relax completely right before the alarm that's just deeply, deeply satisfying. And so you basically have the basic idea. You relax, and you lie in the dark, and while you do that, I tell you a tale. So relax, dear listener. My nighttime friend who has elected to lie in the dark listening to my voice. You will always be safe with me, because I'm here to help you relax, to do my small part to help improve your life in a fairly significant way. People don't sleep well these days, and it makes life harder, so I'm here to do my small part to make your life just that little bit easier, to help you to face tomorrow and the day after, well-rested and better able to cope. Something that's very important and very central to me, especially in the context of Sleepy Time Tales, is the idea of kindness. I'm doing this because I want to be kind to you, to the people who desperately need a good night's sleep. I want to be kindness, kind to you, I want to share kindness with you, but I also need you to be kind to yourself. If you get tense and beat yourself up or rebuke yourself over not being able to sleep, None of this will help. None of this has any point. You need to just roll with it sometimes. Even if I'm here trying to help and you just can't get to sleep. Frustration is one of the great enemies of a good night's sleep. And the intention with this podcast is to short circuit that frustration. To distract that feeling that we get when we lie in the dark and we just can't drift drift into it and we blame ourselves. So take a breath, 
forgive the fact you can't sleep and let my voice wash over you. Take another breath. Imagine the warm darkness rising up, inviting you to sleep and to a better life starting tomorrow. And if you can't let go, forgive yourself and try again tomorrow. If you've had a life of insomnia, sleep is something like an enemy. But it is not your enemy. It's a natural process that we've been pulled away from by stress and life and the progress that shines bright blue lights in our eyes at all hours. So I'm here to work with you. To create a safe space. A cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course, you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream. The Golden Bow a study of magic and religion by Sir James George Fraser. Preface The primary aim of this book is to explain the remarkable rule which regulated the succession to the priesthood of Diana Dorisia. When I first set myself to solve the problem more than 30 years ago, I thought that the solution could be propounded very briefly. But I soon found that to render it probable or even intelligible it was necessary to discuss certain more general questions, some of which had hardly been broached before. In successive editions the discussion of those and kindred topics has occupied more and more space. The inquiry has branched out in more and more directions until the two volumes of the original work have expanded into twelve. Meantime a wish has often been expressed that the book should be issued in a more compendious form. This abridgment is an attempt to meet the wish and thereby to bring the work within the range of a wider circle of readers. While the bulk of the book has been greatly reduced, I have endeavoured to retain its leading principles, together with an amount of evidence sufficient to illustrate them clearly. The language of the original has also for the most part been preserved though here and there the exposition has been somewhat condensed. In order to keep as much of the text as possible, I have sacrificed all the notes and with them all the exact references to my authorities. Readers who desire to ascertain the source of any particular statement must therefore consult the larger work, which is fully documented and provided with a complete bibliography. In the abridgment, I have neither added new matter nor altered the views expressed in the last edition for the evidence which has come to my knowledge in the meantime has had, on the whole, served either to confirm my former conclusions or to furnish fresh illustrations of old principles. Thus, for example, on the crucial question of the practice of putting kings to death either at the end of a fixed period or whenever their health and strength began to fail, the body of evidence which points to the wide prevalence of such a custom has been considerably augmented in the interval. A striking instance of a limited monarchy of the sort is furnished by the powerful medieval kingdom of the Khazars in southern Russia, where the kings were liable to be put to death either on the expiry of a set term, or whenever some public calamity such as drought, dearth, or defeat in war seem to indicate a failure of their natural powers. The evidence of the systematic killing of the Khazar kings drawn from the accounts of old Arab travellers has been collected by me elsewhere. Africa again has supplied several fresh examples of a similar practice of regicide. Among them the most notable perhaps is the custom formerly observed in Banyoro of choosing every year from a particular clan a mock king who was supposed to incarnate the late king cohabiting with his widows at the temple tomb and after reigning for a week was strangled. The custom presents a close parallel to the ancient Babylonian festival of the Sisea at which a mock king was dressed in the royal robes, allowed to enjoy the real king's concubines, and after reigning for five days, was stripped, scourged, and put to death. That festival in its turn has lately received fresh light from a certain Assyrian inscriptions, which seem to confirm the interpretation which I formerly gave of the festival as a New Year's celebration, 
and the parent of the Jewish festival of Purim. Other recently discovered parallels to the priestly kings of Arisia are African priests and kings who used to be put to death at the end of seven or of two years after being liable in the interval to be attacked or killed by a strong man who thereupon succeeded to the priesthood or the kingdom. With these and other instances of like customs before us, it is no longer possible to regard the rule of succession to the priesthood of Diana at Arisia as exceptional. It clearly exemplifies a widespread institution of which the most numerous and the most similar cases have thus far been found in Africa. How far the facts point an early inference of Africa on Italy, or even to the existence of an African population in southern Europe, I do not presume to say. The prehistoric historic relations between the two continents is still obscure and still under investigation. Whether the explanation which I have offered of the institution is correct or not must be left to the future to determine. I shall always be ready to abandon it if a better can be suggested. Meantime, in committing the book to its new form, to the judgment of the public, I desire to guard against a misapprehension of its scope, which still appears to be rough, though I have sought to correct it before now. If in the present work I have dwelt at some length on the worship of trees, it is not, I trust, because I exaggerate its importance in the history of religion. Still less because I would deduce from it a whole system of mythology. It is simply because I could not ignore the subject in attempting to explain the significance of a priest who bore the title King of the Wood, and one of whose titles to office was the plucking of a bough, the golden bough, from a tree in the sacred grove. But I am so far from regarding the reverence for trees as of supreme importance to the evolution of religion that I consider it to have been altogether subordinate to other factors, and in particular to the fear of the human dead, which, on the whole, I believe to have been probably the most powerful force in the making of primitive religion. I hope that after this explicit declaimer, I shall no longer be taxed with embracing a system of mythology which I look upon not merely as false, but as preposterous and absurd. I am too familiar with the Hydra of Error to expect that by lopping off one of the monster's heads I can prevent another, or even the same, from sprouting again. I can only trust to the candor and intelligence of my readers to rectify the serious misconception of my views by comparison with my own express declaration. J.G. Fraser, One Brick Court, Temple, London, June 1922 Chapter 1. The King of the Wood Part 1. Diana and Verbius Who does not know Turner's picture of the golden bough? The scene suffused with the golden glow of the imagination with which the divine mind of Turner steeped and transfigured even the fairest natural landscape is a dreamlike vision of the little woodland na- lake of Nemi. Diana's mirror as it was called by the ancients. No one who has seen that calm water lapped in a green hollow of the Alban hills can ever forget it. The two characteristic Italian villages which slumber on its banks and the equally Italian palace whose terraced gardens descend steeply to the lake hardly break the stillness and even the solitariness of the scene. Diana herself might still linger by this lonely shore, still haunt these woodlands wild. In antiquity, this sylvan landscape was a scene of a strange and recurring tragedy. On the northern shore of the lake, right under the precipitous cliffs on which the modern village of Nemi is perched, stood the sacred grove and sanctuary of Diana Nemerinesis, or Diana of the Wood. The lake and the grove were sometimes known as the lake and grove of Arisia, but the town of Arisia, the modern Larisia, was situated about three miles off at the foot of the Elban Mountain, separated by a steep descent from the lake, which lies in a small crater-like hollow on the mountainside. In the sacred grove there grew a certain tree around which at any time of the day, and probably far into the night, a grim figure might be seen to prowl. In his hand he carried a drawn sword, and he kept peering warily about, as if at any instant he expected to be set upon by an enemy. He was a priest and a murderer, and the man for whom he looked was sooner or later to murder him and hold the priesthood in his stead. Such was the rule of the sanctuary. A candidate for the priesthood could only succeed to office by slaying the priest. 
and having slain him, he retained office till he was himself slain by a stronger or craftier. The post which he held by his precarious tenure carried with it the title of king. But surely no crowned head ever lay uneasy or was visited by more evil dreams than his. For year in, year out, in summer and winter, in fair weather and in foul, he had to keep his lonely watch, and whenever he snatched a troubled slumber, it was at the peril of his life. The least relaxation of his vigilance, the smallest abatement of his strength of limb or skill of fence, put him in jeopardy. Grey hairs might seal his death warrant. To gentle and pious pilgrims at the shrine, the sight of him might well seem to darken the fair landscape, as when a cloud suddenly blots the sun on a bright day. The dreamy blue of Italian skies, the dappled shade of summer woods, and the sparkle of waves in the sun have accorded but ill with that stern and sinister figure. Rather, we picture to ourselves the scene as it may have been witnessed by a belated wayfarer on one of those wild autumn nights, when the dead leaves are falling thick and the wind seems to sing the dirge of dying year. It is a somber picture, set to melancholy music, the background of the forest showing black and jagged against the lowering and stormy sky. The sighing of the wind in the branches, the rustle of the withered leaves underfoot, the lapping of the cold water on the shore, and in the foreground, pacing to and fro, now in twilight and now in gloom, a dark figure with a glitter of steel at the shoulder, whenever the pale moon, riding clear of the cloud rack, peers down at him through the matted boughs. The strange rule of this priesthood has no parallel in classical antiquity and cannot be explained from it. To find an explanation, we must go further afield. No one will probably deny that such a custom savers of a barbarous age and surviving into imperial times stands out in striking isolation from the polished Italian society of the day, like a primeval rock rising from a smooth-shaven lawn. It is the very rudeness and barbarity of the custom which allow us the hope of explaining it, for recent researches into the early history of man have revealed the essential similarity with which, under many superficial differences, the human mind has elaborated its first cruel philosophy of life. Accordingly, if we can show that a barbarous custom like that of the priesthood of Nemi has existed elsewhere, if we can detect the motives which led to its institution, if we can prove that these motives have operated widely, perhaps universally, in human society, producing in varied circumstances a variety of institutions specifically different but generically alike, if we can show lastly that these very motives with some of their derivative institutions were actually at work in classical antiquity, then we may fairly infer that at a remoter age the same motives gave birth to the priesthood of Nemi. Such an inference in default of direct evidence as to how the priesthood actually did arise can never amount to demonstration. But it will be more or less probable according to the degree of completeness with which it fulfills the conditions I have indicated. The object of this book is, by meeting these conditions, to offer a fairly probable explanation of the priesthood of Nemi. I begin by setting forth the few facts and legends which have come down to us on the subject. According to one story, the worship of Diana at Nemi was instituted by Orestes, who, after killing Thoas, king of the Tauric Chersonese, in the Crimea, fled with his sister to Italy, bringing with him the image of the Tauric Diana hidden in a faggot of sticks. After his death, his bones were transported from Arisia to Rome and buried in front of the Temple of Saturn on the Capitoline Slope, beside the Temple of Concord. The bloody ritual which legend described to the Tauric Diana is familiar to classical readers. It is said that every stranger who landed on the shore was sacrificed on her altar. But transported to Italy, the rite assumed a milder form. Within the sanctuary at Nimi grew a certain tree of which no branch might be broken. Only a runaway slave was allowed to break off, if he could, one of its boughs. Success in the attempt entitled him to fight the priest in single combat, and if he slew him, he reigned in his stead with the sight title King of the Woods, Rex Nemerenesis. According to the public opinion of the ancients, the fainful branch was that golden bough, which at Sybil's bidding Aeneas plugged before he essayed into the perilous journey to the world of the dead. The flight of the slave represented, it was said, the flight of Orestes, 
His combat with the priest was reminiscent of the human sacrifices once offered to the Tauric Diana. This rule of succession by the sword was observed down to imperial times. For among his other freaks, Caligula, thinking that the priest of Nimi had held office too long, hired a more stalwart ruffian to slay him. And a Greek traveller who visited Italy in the age of Antonines remarks that down to this time the priesthood was still the prize of victory in a single combat. Of the worship of Diana at Nimi, some leading features can still be made out. From the votive offerings which have been found on the site, it appears that she was conceived of especially as a huntress, and further as blessing men and women with offspring and granting expectant mothers an easy delivery. Again, fire seems to have played a foremost part in her ritual. For during her annual festival held on the 13th of August at the hottest time of the year, the grove shone with a multitude of torches whose ruddy glare was reflected by the lake, and throughout the length and breadth of Italy the day was kept with holy rites at every domestic hearth. Bronze statuettes found in her precincts represented the goddess herself holding a torch in her raised right hand, and women whose prayers had been heard by her came crowned with wreaths and bearing lighted torches to the sanctuary in fulfilment of their vows. Someone unknown dedicated a perpetually burning lamp in a little shrine at Nimi for the safety of the Emperor Claudius and his family. The terracotta lamps which have been discovered in the grove may perhaps have been served the like purpose for humbler persons. If so, the analogy of the customs to the Catholic practice of dedicating holy candles in churches would be obvious. Further, the title of Vesta borne by Diana at Nimi points clearly to the maintenance of a perpetual holy fire in her sanctuary. A large circular basement at the northeast corner of the temple, raised on three steps and bearing traces of a mosaic pavement, probably supported a round temple of Diana in her character Vesta, like the round temple of Vesta in the Roman Forum. Here the sacred fire would seem to have been tended by Vestal virgins, for the head of a Vesta in terracotta was found on the spot, and the worship of a perpetual fire cared for by holy maidens appears to have been common in Latium from the earliest to the latest times. Further, at the annual festival of the goddess, hunting dogs were crowned and wild beasts were not molested. Young people went through a purificatory ceremony in honour. Wine was brought forth, and the feasts served of a kid cakes served popping hot on plates of leaves, and apples still hanging in clusters on the bough. But Diana did not reign alone in her grove of Nimi. Two lesser divinities shared her forest sanctuary. One was Egeria, the nymph of the clear water, which, bubbling from the basaltic rocks, used to fall in graceful cascades into the lake at a place called La Mole, because here were established the mills of the modern village of Nimi. The purling of the stream as it ran over the pebbles is mentioned by Ovid, who tells us that he had often drunk of its water. Women with child used to sacrifice to Egeria because she was believed, like Diana, to be able to grant them an easy delivery. Tradition ran that the nymph had been the wife or mistress of the wise king Numa, that he had consorted with her in the secrecy of the sacred grove, and that the laws which he gave the Romans had been inspired by communion with her divinity. Plutarch compares the legend with other tales of the loves of goddesses for the mortal men, such as the love of Sidil and the moon for the fair youths Attis and Endymion. According to some, the trysting place of the lovers was not in the woods of Nimi, but in a grove outside the dripping Porta Capena at Rome, where another sacred spring of Egeria gushed from a dark cavern. Every day the Roman Vestals fetched water from the spring to wash the temple of Vesta, carrying it in earthenware pitchers on their heads. In Juvenal's time, the natural rock had been encased in marble, and the hallowed spot was profaned by gangs of poor Jews who were suffered to squat like gypsies in the grove. We may suppose that the spring which fell into the lake of Nimi was the true original Egeria, and when the first settlers moved down from the Elban hills to the banks of the Tiber, they brought the nymph with them, and found a new home for her in a grove outside the gates. The remains of baths which had been discovered within the sacred precinct, together with many terracotta models of various parts of the human body, suggested that the waters of Egeria were used to heal the sick who may have signified their hopes or testified their gratitude by dedicating likenesses of the diseased members to the goddess, in accordance with a custom which is still observed in many parts of Europe. 
To this day, it would seem that the spring retains medicinal virtues. The other of the minor deities at Nima was Verbius. Legend had it that Verbius was the young Greek hero Hippolytus, chaste and fair, who learned the arts of venery from the centaur Chiron, and spent all his days in the greenwood chasing wild beasts with the virgin huntress Artemis for his only comrade. Proud of her divine society, he spurned the love of woman, and this proved his bane. For Aphrodite, stung by scorn, inspired his stepmother Phaedra with love of him, and and when he disdained her wicked advances, she falsely accused him to his father Theseus. The slander was believed, and Theseus prayed to his sire Poseidon to avenge the imagined wrong. So while Hippolytus drove in a chariot by the shore of the Saronic Gulf, the sea god sent a fierce bull forth from the caves. The terrified horses bolted, threw Hippolytus from the chariot, and dragged him at their hoofs to death. But Diana, for the love she bore Hippolytus, persuaded the leech Asclepius to bring her fair young hunter back to life by his simples. Jupiter, indignant that a mortal man should return from the gates of death, thrust down the meddling leech himself to Hades. But Diana hid her favorite from the angry god in a thick cloud, disguised his features by adding years to his life, and then bore him far away to the dells of Nemi, where she entrusted him to the nymph Egeria, to live there, unknown and solitary, under the name of Verbius, in the depth of the Italian forest. There he reigned as king, and there he dedicated a precinct to Diana. He had a comely son, Verbius, who, undaunted by his father's fate, drove a team of fiery steeds to join the Latins in the war against Aeneas and the Trojans. Verbius was worshipped as a god, not only at Nemi, but elsewhere. For in Campania, we hear of a special priest devoted to his services. Horses were excluded from the Rician grove and sanctuary because horses had killed Hippolytus. It was unlawful to touch his image. Some thought that he was the sun. But the truth is, says Servius, that he is a deity associated with Diana, as Attis is associated with the mother of the gods, and Erichthonius with Minerva, and Adonis with Venus. What the nature of that association was we shall inquire presently. Here it is worth observing that in his long and checkered career, this mythical personage has displayed a remarkable tenacity of life. For we can hardly doubt that the saint Hippolytus of the Roman calendar, who was dragged by horses to death on the 13th of August, die in his own day, is no other than the Greek hero of the same name, who, after dying twice as a heathen sinner, has happily been resuscitated as a Christian saint. It needs no elaborate demonstration to convince us that the stories told to account for Diana's worship at Nemi are unhistorical. Clearly they belong to that large class of myths which are made up to explain the origin of a religious ritual, and have no other foundation than the resemblance, real or imaginary, which may be traced between it and some foreign ritual. The incongruity of these Nemi myths is indeed transparent, since the foundation of the worship is traced now to Orestes and now to Hippolytus. According, to, according as this or that feature of the ritual has to be accounted for. The real value of such tales is that they serve to illustrate the nature of the worship by providing a standard with which to compare it. And further, that they bear witness indirectly to its venerable age by showing that the true origin was lost in the mists of a fabulous antiquity. In the latter respect, these Nimi legends are probably more to be trusted than the apparently historical tradition. Vouched for by Cato the Elder and the sacred grove was dedicated to Diana by a certain Egerius Babius, or Levius of Tusculum, a Latin dictator, on behalf of the peoples of Tusculum, Aresia, Lanuvium, Laurentium, Cora, Tiber, Pamicia, and Ardina. This tradition indeed speaks for the great age of the sanctuary, since it seems to date its foundations some time before 495 BC, the year in which Pamicia was sacked by the Romans and disappears from history. But we cannot suppose that so barbarous a rule as that of the Arician priesthood was deliberately instituted by a league of civilized communities, such as the Latin cities undoubtedly were. It must have been handed down from a time beyond the memory of man, when Italy was still in a far ruder state than any known to us in the historical period. The credits of the tradition is rather shaken than confirmed by another story 
which ascribes the foundation of the sanctuary to a certain Mania Sagerius who gave rise to the saying, there are many many at Aresia. This proverb some explain by alleging that Mania Sagerius was the ancestor of a long distinguished line, whereas others thought that it meant there were many ugly and deformed people at Aresia, and that they derived the name Manius from Mania, a bogey or bugbear to frighten children. A Roman satirist uses the name Manius as typical of the beggars who lay in wait for pilgrims on the Eurasian slopes. These differences of opinion, together with the discrepancy between Manius, Agerius of Aresia, and Agerius Livius of Tusculum, as well as the resemblance of both names to the mystical Egeria, excite our suspicion. Yet the tradition recorded by Cato seems too circumstantial and its sponsor too respectable to allow us to dismiss it as idle fiction. Rather, we may suppose that it refers to some ancient restoration or reconstruction of the sanctuary, which was actually carried out by the confederated states. At any rate, it testifies to a belief that the grove had been from early times a common place of worship for many of the older cities of the country, if not for the whole Latin confederacy. Chapter 1, Part 2 Artemis and Hippolytus I have said that the Arisian legends of Orestes and Hippolytus, though worthless as history, have a certain value insofar as they may help us to understand the worship at Nemi better by comparing it with the ritual and myths of other sanctuaries. We must ask ourselves, why did the author of these legends pitch upon Orestes and Hippolytus in order to explain Verbius and the King of the Wood? In regards to Orestes, the only answer is obvious. In regards to Orestes, the answer is obvious. He and the image of the Tauric Diana, which could only be appeased with human blood, were dragged in to render intelligible the murderous rule of succession to the Eurasian priesthood. In regard to Hippolytus, the case is not so plain. The manner of his death suggests readily enough a reason for the exclusion of horses from the grove, but this by itself seems hardly enough to account for the identification. We must try to probe deeper by examining the worship as well as the legend or myth of Hippolytus. He had a famous sanctuary at his ancestral home of Trusen, situated on the beautiful, almost landlocked bay where groves of oranges and lemons, with tall cypresses soaring like dark spires above the garden of Hesperides, now clothed the strip of fertile shore at the foot of the rugged mountains. Across the blue water of the tranquil bay which it shelters from the open sea, rises Poseidon's sacred island, its peak veiled in the somber green of pines. On this fair coast Hippolytus was worshipped. Within his sanctuary stood a temple with an ancient image. His service was performed by priests who held office for life. Every year a sacrificial festival was held in his honour and his untimely fate was yearly mourned, with weeping and doleful chants by unwedded maids. Youths and maidens dedicated locks of their hair in his temple before marriage. His grave existed at Trusen though the people would not show it. It has been suggested, with great plausibility, that in the handsome Hippolytus, beloved of Artemis, cut off in his youthful prime and yearly mourned by damsels, we have one of those mortal lovers of a goddess who appears so often in ancient religion, and of whom Adonis is the most familiar type. The rivalry of Artemis and Phaedra for the affection of Hippolytus Reproduces, it is said, under different names, the rivalry of Aphrodite and Proserpine for the love of Adonis. For Phaedra is merely a double of Aphrodite. The theory probably does no injustice either to Hippolytus or to Artemis, for Artemis was originally a great goddess of fertility and on the principles of early religion, she who fertilizes nature must herself be fertile, and to be that she must necessarily have a male consort. On this view, Hippolytus was the consort of Artemis at Trusen, and the shorn tresses offered to him by the, Tr- by the Trusenian youths and maidens before marriage were designed to strengthen his union with the goddess and so to promote the fruitfulness of the earth, of cattle, and of mankind. It is some confirmation of this view that within the precinct of Hippolytus at Trusen there were worshipped two female powers named Damia and Auxesia whose connection with the fertility of the ground is unquestionable. When Epidorus suffered from a dearth, the people, in obedience to an oracle, carved images of Damia and Oxesia out of a sacred olive wood, and no sooner had they done so and set them up than the earth bore fruit again. 
meanwhile at Trusen itself and apparently within the precinct of Hippolytus, a curious festival of stone throwing was held in honour of these maidens, as the Trusenians called them, and it is easy to show that similar customs have been practised in many lands for the express purpose of ensuring good crops. In the story of the tragic death of the youthful Hippolytus, we may discern an analogy with similar tales of other fair but mortal youths, who paid with their lives for the brief rapture of the love of an immortal goddess. These hapless lovers were probably not always mere myths, and the legends which traced their spilt blood in the purple bloom of the violet, the scarlet stain of the anemone, or the crimson flush of the rose, were no idle poetic emblems of youth and beauty fleeting at the summer flowers. Such fables contain a deeper philosophy of the relation of the life of man to the life of nature. A sad philosophy which gave birth to tragic practice. What that philosophy and that practice were, we shall learn later on. Part 3. Recapitulation We can now perhaps understand why the ancients identified Hippolytus, the consort of Artemis, with Furbius who according to Servius stood to Diana as Adonis to Venus, or Attis to the mother of the gods. For Diana, like Artemis, was a goddess of fertility in general, and of childbirth in particular. As such, she, like her Greek counterpart, needed a male partner. That partner, if Servius was right, was Furbius. In his character of the founder of the sacred grove and the first king of Nemi, Furbius is clearly the mythical predecessor or archetype of the line of priests who served Diana under the title King of the Woods, and who came, like him, one off the other, to a violent end. It is natural, therefore, to conjecture that they stood in on the goddess of the grove with the same relation which Phobia stood to her. In short, that the mortal King of the Wood had for his queen the woodland Diana herself. If the sacred tree which he guarded with his life was supposed, as seems probable, to be her special embodiment, her priest may not only have worshipped it as his goddess, but embraced it as his wife. There is nothing absurd in the supposition, since even in the time of Pliny, a Roman noble used thus to treat a beautiful breech tree in another sacred grove in Diana on the Elban Hills. He embraced it, he kissed it, he lay under its shadow, he poured wine on its trunk. Apparently, he took the tree for the goddess. The custom of physically marrying men and women to trees is still practiced in India and other parts of the East. Why should it not have obtained an ancient latium? Reviewing the evidence as a whole, we may conclude that the worship of Diana in her sacred grove at Nemi was of great importance and immemorial antiquity. That she was revered as the goddess of woodlands and of wild creatures, probably also of domestic cattle and of the fruits of the earth. That she was believed to bless men and women with offspring and to aid mothers in childbed. That her holy fire, tended by chaste virgins, burned perpetually in a round temple within the precinct. That associated with her as a water nymph, Phigeria, who discharged one of Diana's own functions by succoring women in travail, and who was popularly supposed to have mated with the old Roman king in the sacred grove. Further, that Diana of the Wood herself had a male companion, Phobius by name, who was to her what Adonis was to Venus, or Attis to Sibyl. And lastly, that this mythical Verbius was represented in historical times by a line of priests known as King of the Wood. Known as Kings of the Wood, who regularly perished by the swords of their successors and whose lives were in a manner bound up with a certain tree in the grove, because so long as that tree was uninjured, they were safe from attack. Clearly, these conclusions do not of themselves suffice to explain the peculiar rule of succession to the priesthood but perhaps the survey of a wider field may lead us to think that they contain in germ the solution of the problem. To that wider survey we must now address ourselves. It will be long and laborious, but may possess something of the interest and charm of a voyage of discovery, in which we shall visit many strange foreign lands, with strange foreign peoples, and still stranger customs. The wind is in the shrouds, we shake out our sails to it, and leave the coast of Italy behind us for a time. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. 
but make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Undeser by Kumiku. Check out more of their work on their website and their Patreon, which you'll find linked in the show notes. Good night and sweet dreams. <laughs>